taking an excursion, or what I've called an excursus, from 1 Peter 1, 3, blessed be, where he begins to speak good words, God word, to look at how a person without a New Testament would understand blessed or blessing. And what much of the modern church world has done, unfortunately, uh, has taken this to mean what's in it for me, rather than understanding the first principles. The words that we've been looking at in the Greek, that eulogitos, which is being translated blessed, carries with it some heavy-duty meaning if we understand that God is telling us about relationship. You know, if you want to know about God's blessings and too much of today's world spends their time, the church world spends their time talking about how they dispense blessings, how God is just a dispenser of blessings, you will never understand the meaning and essence of the word, the Hebrew word, and what is behind it into the Greek without understanding there is a relationship that must be understood and established. In the Old Testament, you were not seeking out the blessings of God. In the Old Testament, you were either living under God's blessing or God's curse. There was nothing in between. You weren't going hunting to look for what God, what will God bless me with. It was a way of life. You were either living in that frame of reference under God's blessing or you were cursed. Now, a lot of people don't like to talk about this because the way we like to think of Scripture, the way we like to interpret it, puts everything favorably towards me. But in the Old Testament realm, this is what was being revealed to us. Now, if you are following along on your page four of your handout. So on page four, at the beginning of page four, I give you an example. We're still, I'm focusing on the eulogy words, which effectively are the Baroque words, versus the secondary example, which is denoting a condition or state, what we call ashri, or makarioi, which we're not talking about today. We're looking at, it would be the first line on your handout. Uh, I've got a camera right here. I'm not going to pull it up on my my, uh, tablet. So just the first line right here, whatever this is, that's what we're looking at. And as you can see here, just even if you don't read Hebrew, the first line of this, where that word it says baruchi, or baraki, it is a different form than the form of my text. And I'm going to share with you why this is so important to explain. I should have put down here, this is Psalm 28 and verse 6, I believe it is. If you want to turn there in your Bible, but I've got something I'll project for you. Now, the reason why we're looking at the handout is it's going to make a distinction. And we're still going to stay in perfect context with this study. Now... If you'll take the time, if you haven't taken the time to read through this and look at the uses of Barak, we find that from this handout, from the limited information I've given you there, there's plenty, plenty more. But this word, ba, and this is ru, you sounding, and k, not but ha, uh, b r k. All right, this word carries with it some very distinct connotations. Why is this important for believers to understand this? And what impact will this make on your life as you study the scriptures? A lot. Okay? Now, what I've done is, as I said, I'm following, I'm trying to follow some pattern of the handout so you can go back after the lesson and reread it. Today's lesson is just basically we're starting on the Hebrew concept of Barak, so I've given you page four if you'll read it uh, when you leave here at some time during the week to kind of refresh what I'm going to do here. Now, there are a few ways to tackle studying the principles we're doing. Here, I'm going to ask you to turn to Psalm 28. There are a few ways to 
tackle this. I've put the text on the board in the Hebrew, and you're going to love this. Uh, 28.6, you can see I've given you the text, and you can see it's right here. It's the same thing I've just put on the board. And one of the reasons why I need to show how this works in a psalm is it's going to give you background for how it will be effectively understood in the New Testament. Psalm 28. This is going to give you an idea of why when we speak of 1 Peter, bless God, or blessed be the God and Father and so forth, it's going to give you an idea of the undergirding. So, as I said, there's more than one way to tackle this. Psalm 28 is a psalm of lament, prayer, and what is being referred to as praise. Now, we can tackle this in an analytical way. An an analytical way would let us have the lexical, uh, we'll put here the reference, the word, and the referent, who is being referred to, reference, might as well spell it out. And using a, a triangle of sorts, the reference, the lexical word, and the referent. The problem with this type of analysis for this is you're only going to end up looking at one frame of reference. What is being referenced, the word itself, and who it is being referred to. So that would be the analytical way. We could analyze this text or the word blessing or anything we want to in an operational way, which is how it functions. Therefore, context is needed. And we could analyze this, last but not least, in a semantic way, which is what I've chosen to do. And the semantic way gives you, we'll call it a circle that contains the word, Barak in the middle, and then hinged to it on the periphery are other words such as praise, like halal, such as thanks or thanksgiving, such as grace, such as exalt, and so forth. But at the very center of what will be understood will be this word. We can analyze the text in many different ways. I've chosen the semantic field method because it has let me see that not all blessed words are the same. I'm going to prove this to you today, and I'm also going to prove to you what it does in the life of a believer. This has helped me tremendously to understand that when I pray, when I'm asking God for things, this is a pattern for me, given for my understanding. Let's first read through Psalm 28, just straight King James. Unto thee will I cry, O Lord, my rock. Be not silent to me, lest if thou be silent to me and I become like them that go down into the pit. Hear the voice of my supplications when I cry unto thee, when I lift up my hands toward thy holy oracle. Draw me not away with the wicked and with the workers of iniquity, which speak peace to their neighbors, but mischief is in their hearts. Give them, literally repay them, according to their deeds, according to the wickedness of their endeavors. Give them, after the work of their hands, render to them their desert. And I know it's funny because of the way it's spelled, but that is the way it's pronounced. Because they regard not the works of the Lord, nor the operation of his hands, he shall destroy them and not build them up. Here we go. Blessed be the Lord, because he hath heard the voice of my supplications. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in him, and I am helped. Therefore my heart greatly rejoiceth, and with my song will I praise him. The Lord is their strength, and he is the saving strength of his anointed. Save thy people and bless thine inheritance. Feed them also and lift them up forever. Okay, let's take a look. So I've separated the song into two parts. If you can see that, The pink part that is outlined is prayer, lament, prayer, lament. And then verse 5 begins the shift from the psalmist to focus on God, then blessing, barak, 
praise, praise, and then blessing again. And I've done this to kind of step away from the way we normally read and interpret Scripture, to get a fresh perspective on what really is happening, because it's so, it is so full of instruction for us, and yet it's very easy to just read over and make it a psalm, just like any other Bible reading, and say, next, no big deal. The next image is to show you same psalm, so this is the same psalm, Psalm 28. So the psalmist has some issues that he is addressing. The focus on the psalmist, my hands are lifted towards your, the King James is translating, holy oracle, and I'm going to do some translation here because there's some terrible translation. But the psalmist says, I lift my hands after he says, God, are you listening to me? In fact, there's some pretty staggering things that he says from the Hebrew that I'd be afraid to say to God. But So he speaks of the work of basically of his hands, the lifting up of his hands and pointing and directing towards the holy sanctuary, not the holy of holies, but the holy place. As he lifts his hands up and asks God for help to intervene in his petition, in his prayer. The next area of focus, so I've highlighted here my hands, which is the psalmist's hands. Then that occurs, by the way, in verse 2. In verse 4, the psalmist is going to highlight their hands, the work of their hands. God, pay them back according to the work of their hands, their doings, their deeds. And he puts the emphasis on their hands. And last but not least, I've broken this down to look at, the psalmist directs his attention after saying, listen, God, hear my petition. I'm, I'm calling you now. And I want you to take care of my enemies. These are my enemies. Now, they won't regard the work of your hands, your workmanship, what you do. So he immediately goes from where he is, looking Godward, to looking at God, respond to my plea, immediately to they will not acknowledge the work of your hands. So I put this out here to show these are the highlight elements of this psalm. So here, be, here comes the call. This is all the same psalm, by the way, just different colors to highlight things. Unto thee will I cry, O Lord, my rock, be not silent to me, lest if thou be silent. Let's, let's really get some and put some meat and potatoes on this. And he says, I call to my rock. He's saying to God, literally the Hebrew reads, don't turn a deaf ear to me, God. I mean, that's almost teeters on the blasphemous side to say that, but that's what he said. He said, don't, don't be deaf to my call. The King James uses silent in both places, but in one place he says, don't, don't turn a deaf ear to me. And in fact, I've got tons of good notes as to the difference between silent, which is the second one, which is to hush or to hold back, the true meaning of silence, versus the first one. He says, I'm calling to you, my rock. Don't turn a deaf ear to me, lest if you stay silent, I might become like those who go down in the pit. Now, the focus eventually we will get to is the psalmist blessing God. But he doesn't start off that way, and most of us don't start off that way. Most of us start out by saying, God, are you listening? Can you hear? Do you not see? And really putting the emphasis on what he's saying, like those who go down to the pit, he could have used another word for the word for that he's using here. Baur is not, it is not Sheol, but it's, it's a picture word. Like those who go down in the dungeon, the prison, the cistern, with no way out into the abyss is what the psalmist is saying, and immediately goes from this setting the scene into, and I want you to, grammarians take note here, the psalmist has the audacity, it's David, by the way, has the audacity to, in the imperative, say to God, hear, hear, hear the voice of my supplications. He doesn't say, Holy God, if it be possible. 
Here come the stained glass tones. <laughs> Imperatively, I mean, there are lessons in here of every kind. There are lessons on how to pray in here. There are lessons on how to praise and how to take our situations and point them Godward. Get off of yourself, get out of your frame of reference and look to God. But right here, I want to just give this example. He says, hear, an imperative, hear the voice of my supplications. Now let me, indulge me for a minute because I can't go by words without saying one or two things in passing. I find it interesting that the etymological basis of supplication of the word supplication is sup, which is the Latin sub, under or down, and plicare, from words that we get like placate, but here it is to bend or fold, with bending or folding. So the voice of my supplications has a a real connotation that carries really the essence of the negative side of, as I've described, blessing God on, on bended knee, versus the voice of my supplications, which is still to be down, folded down, the cry, the despair. You know, a lot of people won't read these lament psalms because they can't see past the fact that inside every one of these psalms is a picture of you and me at some point in our life, some of us weekly. Never mind. So, the psalmist imperatively, David, is crying out, Hear the voice of my supplication for my, my cry for help. Your King James, verse 2, hear the voice of my supplications when I cry unto thee, when I lift up my hands toward thy holy oracle. I cry for help. I lift up my hands toward thy innermost sanctuary. This is not the holy of holies, but it is the place, the holy place before the holy of holies. The direction of God's house in the Old Testament, wherever God's presence was. Now, without going to the rest of the psalm, I'm going to jump right away to show you where you can find these helps for faith in your time of distress. Look to this psalm, because he goes from imperatively hear the voice of my supplication, for I cry to thee, I lift up my hands, and I'm pointing them towards your sanctuary, to the response, as I've indicated. Blessed be Yahweh, for he has heard the voice of my supplications. Here is the call imperatively, the call to God here. I'm not asking you, God. I'm speaking imperatively. You know, there's, there's people who talk about faith, and then there's the psalmist, psalmist who talks faith. And some of us spend a lot of time talking about faith, and some of us talk faith. This is faith being uttered in a moment of saying, God, did you not say? In fact, elsewhere, there's a a passage in Psalms 31, Psalm 31, 22, where he says, In my haste, don't turn, I'll read it to you. For I said, In my haste, I am cut off from before thine eyes. Nevertheless, thou heardest the voice of my supplications when I cried unto thee. We're too quick to say, God is not even listening to me. That's why I take comfort, because he went from an imperative, hear the voice of my supplications, and at some point switches gears to blessing God because he has heard, past tense, he has heard, perfect rather, the voice of my supplications. Now, what does this have to do with being blessed or blessings or... The blessed one has a lot to do. The psalmist is saying something to God because because he has heard the voice, Shamua kol, this is a good tongue twister, Tachanuchai, because he has heard the voice of my supplications. You wouldn't want to be supplicating too much if you had to say that in Hebrew, believe me. Either that or you'd have a very clear throat. So, I want you to just focus the attention here on what the driving force ultimately will be. Um, You have the call, as I said, the call to God to hear 
don't turn a deaf don't turn a deaf ear don't be deaf to me now i'm not saying this this is what the translators say and i'm not trying to be politically correct neither was david he's speaking to god lest if you be silent i'll be like those going down to the pit the imperative hear the voice of my supplication my cry for help when i lift up my hands towards your innermost sanctuary the holy place and then he begins to tell us about the enemies. Who are these enemies of God? All right. Begins to tell us about the enemies. This two verses here, verses 3 and 4, when he says, Draw me not away with the wicked, literally to not be to, to, to draw or to drag, to be taken away with the workers of iniquity, which speak peace to their neighbors, but mischief is in their hearts. Now, you know, we can read that and make that extremely King James and very poetic, but I know a lot of people like that. They, they have that slick tongue. They're always willing to share a good word with you, but inside they're, they're saying, they're, they're kind of probably just rolling their eyes or whatever it is they're saying about you. That, you've met people like that, surely, that are real nice and slick on the outside, and then when it comes time for the real deal, they're pl- full of daggers. Yeah? All right. So, listen, uh, I've, I've met too many of them to... Uh... So, basically, when he says, who speak peace with their neighbors, uh, the concept is that they're, while they're full of mischief, the Hebrew carries with it evil, misery, distress, injury. That's what they carry around. And he goes on to say, David does, He says, God, pay them back. Pay them back according to their works, according to their evil deeds, according to the the work of their hands. Pay them back. Requite them. Render their due reward. The benefit, recompense, just uh, as a sidebar, somebody was, I was talking with somebody and they said, uh, King James says, dessert, does not say dessert as in uh, ice cream and cake. But there are actually three ways, if you look in the dictionary, that desert is pronounced. It's all spelt the same. There is, there is to abandon. There's as an adjective, and there's multiple ways. So it's really not a, it's not a spelling mistake. It reads exactly the way it should. Um, but he says, render to them according to their works. And he references, let me remind you, I started off with him saying, I'm calling out to you, lifting my hands and pointing them towards your holy place. The works of their hands, these are the enemies of God's people. And listen, you've got to put a face on this for a minute. If it just becomes a, a psalm, it's merely just words on paper. Put a face to this. There are people who are constantly intruding into our lives, and they are... You know, they come across as nice people, but they're enemies. They'll do anything to trip you up, anything to keep you from your commitments. They think what you do, the way you study or the way you worship, is absolutely banal. You're just, you know, at our church, we do this, and we do that, and we do a lot of this, and we do a lot of that. (laughs) You guys don't do anything. Well, the people will come and put themselves and their mindset in your face to hinder you and literally become a stumbling block. Put a face on this. Otherwise, it's just absolutely uh, words on paper. Nothing more, nothing less. Now, I want to show you what happens here because I, I think it's pretty neat. First go around, we have, as I said, lament and prayer. Something interesting will happen. It only takes... Four, and then into the fifth verse, where David will change his focus and look Godward. Man, if I could just do it that quickly, I would be happy. I don't usually, my life is not divided into chapter and verse, but if it was, my verses would be days. (laughs) You'll remember that at a later time. At least here it happens quickly. You know, this is the only time that the Bible and television have something in common. (laughs) You watch a sitcom, it's solved in 30 minutes or less. You read the Psalms, and it sounds like, ah, he came to that conclusion rather quickly, didn't he? Four and a half verses later, it's all good, right? Okay. 
just keeping it real here. So I want you to see the first shift. The first shift is with this Hebrew word ki, for or because. Because they do not regard. Man, I, I, it just makes me angry sometimes, the words that were chosen. Because they regard not the works they regard not the works of the Lord nor the operation of his hands. He shall destroy them, not build them up. Let's talk a little bit about regarding the works. This word here should be more, it would be a better translation to say not discerning. It's not just a blatant disregard. It's not discerning. When God says he can, he will. You know, Psalm 53 opens with, the fool has said, said in his heart, there is no God. It's like that, not discerning. God cannot, from, from the enemy's point of view, God could not possibly whatever. But David says, because they don't discern the works of Yahweh and, or the work of his hands, so he'll break them down, God will, and build them up no more. Now, keep in mind that God has a great track record through his word of building people up and tearing people down. And those that refuse and have refused through the Old Testament to look Godward, he made sure through the hand of time that those who wouldn't acknowledge him perished. And some even acknowledged him in a, we'll call it a fictitious way. Pharaoh said, I have sinned. But he really didn't understand what that mean, and God hardened his heart. He still didn't understand what was happening to him. It's just an acknowledgement with the mouth, but not in the heart. So, David's lining all this up. You can see the call, I'll repeat it, the imperative command. He talks about his enemies. He immediately looks Godward and says, because they don't discern. They're not even able to get this. And I put down, I have a whole list of scriptures I won't bore you with, but I have a whole list of scriptures that carry this not discerning, not discerning with the eyes out of Proverbs of all places, not discerning with the mind, not discerning with the taste or the touch. You know, the psalmist says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Well, what does that mean? It means to discern by some sensory apparatus, to discern with the mind, to discern with the eyes of faith, not the eyes that are the reality of your circumstance. So it's pretty clear. And then something incredible happens right in the middle of this psalm. That's why I divided and put those two columns. Right in the middle of things, let's go back, see if I, uh, you never know. I, it's the only time where you get to decide if something gets saved or not. An an introductory course to preaching in other churches. All right. So this is why I put it into two columns, because you can see here is the lament from verses 1 through 4, and then, as I said, the change that occurs from verse 5. The focus is on God and God's work and the work of his hands and what God is able to do, including destroy the enemies of God. He's capable of taking care of what needs to be taken care of. So watch what happens here. We're going to go forward again. See, I just didn't save that either. I feel very godlike using this thing. All right. Okay. Let me see if there's anything more here. There isn't. I've gone to the end. Let me go back there. Something real interesting happens here. This is the part, the, the bulk of why this becomes important. After he cries out to God, tells about his enemies, focuses on God. He does something very incredible. Your King James says, blessed or blessed be the Lord. I'm reading from my Hebrew, so I want to make sure that I'm quoting this right. Blessed be the Lord, definite article. Blessed be the Lord. And because, because, and let's put dot, dot, dot. For weeks now, I've been trying to tell or show or demonstrate why one word must be rightly understood 
when we understand God's word a little bit better, our language frame will shift. This word here, hold your breath. Everybody go. Okay. This word here is a passive, I know, I heard it, passive participle. And this is Yahweh, all right? We'll put here, let's just put Yahweh. Now, passive participle, subject is the Lord. Blessed is the word in the past participle. This becomes important because I've heard people say that we cannot bless God per se. We cannot actively do that which is being declared. Now, if we rightly understand Hebrew grammar, we can. There needs to be a defining of what it means and how it applies to us. Remember, he's gone through all these steps, focus is turned on God, suddenly he says, Blessed be the Lord God, for he has heard the voice of my supplications. So, putting this as a past participle makes it something that is passive, past, and the Lord is the recipient. I'm going to try and do this as an example. It'll open up vistas of understanding. The Hebrew has voice, active and passive, in its grammar of participles. In the active voice, check this out, the king... It's an example. The king is judging. Who is judging? The king. The king is doing the action. Therefore, it's active. Is that clear? Simple, right? The king is judging. The king is doing the action. Therefore, this is active. The king is the subject. The king is judging. Now, the king is being judged. Passive, because the king is receiving the action of being judged. The king is no longer judging. This is active. The king is judging. The king is doing the action of judging. The king is being judged. The action is being performed on him. Clear? Claro? Okay. Hold that thought. Because participles are that simple. You mean, you frustrated us on festival (laughs) to just do this? No. I'm giving you the simplistic version of the most basic basic, because I don't want you to sit here and be (sighs) pulling your hair out. So, hold that thought. Let me repeat this for a minute. Active voice, all right? The king is judging. Passive voice. The king is being judged. The action is being performed on the king in the passive and in the active, the king is, being ju- is, is judging. Now, let's go right back over here. This is a participle in the Hebrew. It's in the passive. That means that the Lord is the subject receiving the action. It's passive. The Lord is receiving the action of the blessing. So, why is there a B Because when you take the participle and translate it into the English, you need to supply something like to be, to have, all right? And it messes us up because really all you need to understand is that the blessing is being performed or given to or uttered to God. Now, you're going to say, well, but how do we bless God? Let me explain because it will make perfect sense. Only God in the Old Testament could bless in the truest sense. That is, giving prosperity, giving fertility, bringing rain. Only God can do that. When the same word is used of man, like here, blessing God, some of the translators translated praising God because it was too complex to define that the two are not the same, and yet they are. When God blesses, he pours out tangible, he pours out spiritual When we bless, when we bless as the psalmist is blessing God, God, the Lord is the subject and he is the recipient because this is passive, two things need to be noted. We say bring your money, bring your tithes and your offerings because that's what you can offer to God. But 
a real saint of God will say, but God gave me the power to get this, and what he's given me still came from him, this tangible item I'm offering back to him. If I don't have a right mindset when I bring my tithes and offerings, I'm not bringing my money. I'm giving back to him what he gave to me and saying, here, Lord, this is a recognition that I'm bought and paid for. You bought and paid me. This is yours, and I'm giving it back to you. And the paradox is, if it's understood as a paradox, God blesses that when he sees the heart of surrendering that which you recognize is not your own anyways. But when man blesses God in this framework, there are three occasions in the Old Testament where it is causative because. So, passive, man is uttering something to God because, relative clause, because, for the reason of, he hath heard the voice, he heard the voice of my supplications. Now, let me be clear about something. Because we can give no tangible blessing in true fact back to God, we can bless God with our mouths. See, there's nothing else. Once you disconnect the fact that when you bring your tithes and offerings, that belongs to God anyway, and a man truly or a woman truly understands they're standing before God when they say, I have nothing and I'm just dust, like the psalmist. Then you understand only with your mouth which is always translated by specifically the NIV praise. Can you understand what it means to bless God back because inevitably we have no tangible goods to give to God that aren't his to begin with. So the only thing we can offer him is to bless. And if you remember a few weeks back, I was talking about the Holy Spirit given to us. The Holy Spirit is given to us amongst many things that we might praise his name. So this is not something that somebody would do just willy-nilly. This is someone with a recognition of God's operating in their life, taking, forgive the colloquial, taking care of business for them. And because of that, now there are two other places outside of this psalm. Psalm 28 and verse 6, that's my sign for psalm. Psalm 31 and Psalm 66, I think it's 20, don't quote me. These two psalms have this key, 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 because of four. Psalm 66 does the same thing with another particle, but it's the same thing. Three places where Barak is being identified for something that God has beneficently uh, bestowed upon somebody. It's a coming back to God to give thanks And it needs to be understood because there's no word that we have to match it. Praise doesn't match it because the Hebrew has a word for praise. Hallel. There must be some understanding. This word bless, when we direct it Godward, has with it and carries with it the connotation of thanksgiving, of praise. It carries with it a multitude. That's why I said I'm taking the semantic field to say many words can convey the meaning, but only at the center of this, when you understand a right relationship between God and man, where a right relationship between God and man, God bestows a blessing. Man, in right relationship to God, speaks Godward, a good word eulogizing, speaking Godward, the things. Now, in this particular case, it's for what the Lord has done. This is the tragedy of the modern church world. You know, some some person who had some grain of understanding took a word out of this framework and made it what we call the testimony, okay? There's so many shades of things to be clearly identified in the Bible. What a radical insult to God that we just clump a whole bunch of garbage in here and sit down and think it's gold when we recount it rather than the true testimony, which is God's word, of the psalmist saying, because he has done this thing. In this case, let's go back. In this case, originally, we had here a call to God, 
hear my supplication, my cry for help, and the response after talking Godward and acknowledging him. You know, the psalmist is pretty clear. Acknowledge him in everything that is, all everything that is around you, and he'll clear the way. He'll, he'll be the light onto your feet. He'll be the pathway. He'll guide you if you'll look to him. The psalmist is embodying that. And the response comes right here. Man, well, let's use the NIV for a minute. Man blessing God because he hath heard the voice of my supplications. Now, interestingly enough, it's like all things kind of tie together. At the root of this word, ta, ta chanuchai, chanuchai, is the word chen, which is favor, favor or grace, and sometimes is also being translated as mercy in some cases. And I thought, you know, it's like God is saying the same thing in so many different ways for us hardheads. Maybe the light will come on one day and we'll say, oh, that's what it meant. You know, Jesus cleanses the ten, the lepers. One comes back. Only one came back to give thanks. Only one came back to acknowledge. Only one came back. And they were crying out many times, as I've declared the last few weeks, they were crying out for mercy. I find it amazing that the voice of supplications carries with it a cry for mercy, a cry for favor from God. It contains all of those things that we as believers at some point are confronted with this harsh reality. Periodic stupid bills, I call them. You know, God's not doing anything for me, and God must not see where I am, and I can't take the pressure anymore. I'm about to collapse. Yeah? Anybody here? Or am I the only weird person? No, I'm normal, folks, okay? Just deal with it. I'm normal. Now, as if all this isn't good enough, you know, there's a passage in Jeremiah 33, 3, Call unto me, the Lord speaking, call unto me. I have it here as a quote, and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things. And God is always waiting for us to call unto him. Now, it seems remarkable. Somewhere amongst my plethora of notes here, I made, I made a note to lose it. How's that? Here we go. Let me just tell you, so you don't think, well, is this all? Because there's going to be so many times where the blessed be formula, as I've called it, I have to call it that to put a label on it and keep the label the same each time. Is this the only time where it appears? No. There are four major types of Barak formulas. This is one with the key, because he hath heard the voice of my supplication. That's one. There's another kind, which is Barak Yawa with a clause describing the beneficent action following no conjunction, where it goes completely back to God. And Barak as the title, so blessed be the Lord, the rock of my salvation, where it's a title of God, and inside the title is the description of what the psalmist is blessing God for. He is my rock. He is my fortress. Blessing for that which describes God. And last but not least, there is Barak for no reason, but descriptive or modifier, like blessed be the Lord God forever and ever. Amen. So when you break down these patterns, they are reoccurring. And the greatest thing that I found with doing this study is that after the corner is turned from I'm calling to you, I'm lamenting about my situation, I recognize God, Now, God has responded. Talk about faith in action. Go back to my tablet here. This is faith in action. Right in the middle of the psalm, when he says, hear imperatively the voice of my supplication, then he blesses God because he hath heard. That's faith. Whether or not, believe me, whether or not between uh, four verses, God actually did something. He talked himself into amening God's word because God gave a word. And man, I'm telling you something. I was reading 1 Kings, where Solomon is addressing the people in the temple. And I thought, to hear the certainty 
with which Solomon prayed when he said, God, we've made the place, and we, we ask that your, your blessing, your eyes be upon this place night and day, the certainty which, which he talked to God, not like, well, God, if it might, if it be your will, if it be possible, like it's, uh, I'll, I'll give you a minute to decide here. When you, when you get back to me when you have a chance. <laughs> but the certainty of the psalmist, hear my voice now, because he hath heard the voice of my supplications. You know, sometimes that's what we need to do. We need to start speaking faith, and then faith acts follow. You know, there's a lot of times where you just say, I can't, I just, I don't see it. Look to this psalm and see a pattern. He's already saying, the Lord's done it. And maybe the Lord hasn't already done it. Maybe he hasn't taken care of his enemies. Maybe he hasn't reacted and done all immediately. But he says, he hath done this thing. He hath heard the voice of my supplication. Now, here's the good part of this. It's not a one-way street with God. Because here's the end, end result. Therefore, I'm on verse 7. Therefore, what does your verse 7 say? The Lord is my strength. And my shield, my heart trusted in him, and I am helped. Therefore, I just put, I took the liberty, uh, forgive me, I put the, the therefore on my tablet, if you can see it. I just put it right up there, therefore. I didn't even wait for the King James people. I just put it right in there. Voice of my supplications, therefore. You know, because at some point, we all need to shift gears. You know, you can spend time in a depressive state, and believe me, there isn't a saint of God that is, by some way, you you can't put yourself in a bubble. That's what modern Christianity tells you. Live in a bubble. It's all happy there. That's not the way it works. And in fact, now that I know the truth about God's word and his active functioning in my life, I wouldn't want to live in a bubble because it is by these means, by my pitfalls, by the days that are not so good, that God helps me to latch on to him and trust him even more. It's not when I'm on the mountaintop. It's not when everything is, oh, things are going good today. And probably, you know, you don't hear people blessing God. When everything's good, God tends to take the back seat. You know, it's the cry of, hear the voice of my supplications. Not, hear my blessing, Lord. I'll give you a reward for that if you can do that. But verse 7, Yahweh is my strength. Remember, he shifted gears now. Yahweh is my Uzi. That strength that comes from within that only God can give. It is God's strength imputed to man and my shield. We have a twofold activity now. For some reason, something happened. I don't know, you know, hit his head. Wow, blessed be the Lord. <laughs> wow, God's my strength <laughs> and my shield. Woo, all right. But God is my inner strength, Uzi. He is my inner strength and my shield, Magini. In him trusts my heart. Of course, this familiar word to this congregation, Batak, that is that leaning with complete assurance that God will, and in this case, it's going into a past tense frame of reference. He will, he has, and then watch what happens. The Lord is my strength. He, the strength comes from him, and he's my shield. He's my protector. My heart trusts in him, so I am helped. This is a different word than the cry for help that he gave in verse 2 which I'm not sure appears in your King James. No, it doesn't even appear in your King James. But there's a cry for help in the Hebrew in verse 2. It's a different word. This word, by the way, is related to Uzi 2. I am helped. I am strengthened. The inner man of me is strengthened, that I've focused my eyes on him now. And he's done this thing for him. My inner person is strengthened and exalts. My heart exalts, and with my song, I give thanks to him. So first... Yahweh is my strength. Next, Yahweh is the strength of his people. I love this because, you know, sometimes we get really self-centered. When we ask something of God, we ask for ourselves, we put our needs first. I love what happens here. This is a blanket prayer and a blanket 
praise to God. The Lord is my strength. The Lord is their strength. To his people. The refuge, strong tower or fortress. This is a little bit taxing to translate this. But basically, the victories of his anointed he is. He is the one that gets the victory. If your strength comes from him, the victory is his. And then a kind of tragic uh, translation in the King James, save thy people, bless thine inheritance, feed them also. Is that what your King James reads? Feed them also and lift them up forever. Well, he says imperatively, just so you know that the imperative wasn't only to hear when he had a need, but he says imperatively, save your people. And imperatively, God, bless your people. Now, it's, he's imperatively saying to God, bless your people, save your people, bless your people, and their heritage, their inheritance. Now, watch, I love the Hebrew here that the King James just missed out on. You see here, Royim. That is the word for shepherd. Be, and they did it right here, be thou their shepherd and carry them, lift them, bear them forever. Be thou their shepherd. This King James said, feed them also. Be a shepherd to them and carry them forever. If we place our trust in him and we immediately have a pattern for prayer here, we're going to know why David had good reason to bless God. He hath heard the voice of my supplication. He hath heard, hear the good words being spoken to God. God receives the good word of this man because he heard the voice of my supplications. And he goes on to tell about all that God will do. He is my strength. He's the strength of his people and Fortress and shield and shepherd, and he'll carry you and take care of you if you'll trust him. You know, it, it, it takes so long to unfold the word, to get a right fix. As I said, it's our language frame that hinders us. You know, I, I would read this, blessed be the Lord, and I'd try to figure out, well, how can, how can a man bless God? But the grammar tells me, A man blesses God by recognizing what God has done. In this particular example and the examples in Psalms 31 and 66 for what God has done, because effectively, we have nothing else to give to God. Effectively, if we're really honest, I don't care how much money you have or how little you have, before him, we're all paupers. We have nothing to offer him. Not a thing. You come and your first offering is what you give back to him, what he's given you. But the other offering you give is with your mouth, speaking those good words, God word, in recognition to him, not to somebody else. I mean, I don't care if you want to tell somebody else, but the first goer is to give back to him that which he gave to you. God, in the beginning, blessed his people and spoke to Adam and Eve and blessed them and said to them and spoke the blessing to them. God gives every single man and woman the opportunity, as this is a pattern, in our private devotional life to turn around and utter those good words, God word, in giving him what kind of makes me cringe to say because it, it sounds so awkward that I would say this. It's an acknowledgement in thanks. It's an acknowledgement in gratitude. It's an acknowledgement because he hath heard the voice of my supplication. I am speaking these words to him. He receives my words. And before where the psalmist said, hear my voice, hear my plea, he says, because he hath heard the voice. You know, that's reason to come back and give thanks to God and not be like those nine that didn't come back to the Lord Jesus when he did something, to come back and speak a word. And that's not speaking a word here in the sanctuary. This is between you and God. You know, I travel to many different churches and sanctuaries and places where people come out and 
they bring out all the pomp and circumstance. I've been in places where the ceremony and people are coming out and they make their way to the, you know, the, they come here and they stand there and they've got a little order and ceremonial stuff. You know, that's all great. But the only thing that I really feel matters is when there's no one around, when there's no other eyes to observe your spirituality or your ceremonialism, but what you do between you and God in a relationship as for what God has done for you in your life. That's where the rubber meets the road. That's where real Christianity, at the intersection of where you are and where you claim by faith you want to be, becomes reality. Now, much more to teach and take apart on the word blessed, but I pray at least today, understanding has come that we can do something. We can speak a good word to God from the heart and recognize all that he has done for us and, and what he continues to do repeatedly and continuously. But until we pick up the subject again, God's willing, uh, next, next week, but until we pick up the subject again, I hope you will gravitate towards this psalm, and at least if you're like me, where you find yourself periodically wrestling for a faith handle, look to David. He at least started off by saying, hear my supplication, and he blessed God because he said, he hath heard, reason to rejoice. My God is alive, my God is real, and he still hears the prayers and petitions and supplications of his dear children. That's my message. I'm Pastor Melissa Scott, pastor of Faith Center, Glendale, California. I teach every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. If you'd like to attend services with us, simply call the 800 number, that is 800-338-3030, to join us. If you'd like to watch, listen, and learn 24 hours a day, simply log on to our website at www.pastormelissascott.com.